Hi folks and welcome back to Contract Law. This is video 5 in our video series on contents of a contract and exclusions. And in this video we are going to look at incorporated terms. Now incorporated terms are a little bit like collateral contracts in that they are terms that are outside the main body of contract terms. Uh, nevertheless the court is searching around and trying to find a way to enforce them. So as we saw in the last video in this video series uh, with collateral contracts the way that uh, the court went about enforcing those was as a separate and complete in itself contract that floated kind of alongside and uh, operated uh, auxiliary to the main terms of the body in the main contract. Uh, the terms that are incorporated by various different means here in this video uh, similarly are terms that have been left out of the main body of the contract but they're kind of swept in to the contract not in a physical sense they're not included in the main body of the contract but they're kind of somehow um, brought in. They are incorporated. Okay, so <clears throat> the main uh, forum or setting I guess you could say for discussion of terms that are incorporated often tends to be around nasty little things called exclusion clauses <clears throat> and we'll talk a bit more about exclusion clauses at the very end of this video series um, but just kind of bookmark that little fact uh, because it might help you to appreciate some of the cases that we're going to discuss in this video. There are a couple of things that you need to know before we launch into our discussions of the various different ways that you can incorporate terms into a contract. Now, first relates to notice. There are a couple of different kinds of notice that you need to be aware of. The first is actual notice and that is where the person is actually aware of the term, the representation, the statement or whatever that is purportedly incorporated into the contract. So someone has said, here are these terms that I want to be incorporated into this contract. Why don't you read them? Once you've read them and you knew about them, uh, that would be actual notice of the terms. The second is a little bit more fuzzy, I guess, and we call it constructive notice. And constructive notice pops up in a number of different areas of law. Uh, in terms of contract law, constructive notice is uh, where a party might not actually have actual notice, actually have actual notice uh, of the terms, but nevertheless, so far as the law is concerned, uh, in the circumstances that have been shown to the court, they should have become aware of the terms. And uh, because they should have become aware of the terms, uh, it is said basically that they are constructively aware of uh, those terms. That normally happens where, for example, someone has taken reasonable steps to bring the terms to that person's notice. Um, and so, notice might be actual notice or something less than actual notice uh, where someone's done the best they could to tell you about the terms that they want to bring into the contract. Now, why is that even relevant? Why am I kicking off the discussion with this little snippet of information. It's because terms can only be incorporated as contractual terms regardless of where they are. They can only be incorporated into the bargain if the parties have assented to the terms. Now you can't assent to terms that you don't know about. So you're going to have to know about them either actually or constructively. Okay, so Moving on from there, but what I want to do now is have a look at the various different ways that terms are incorporated into the contract. Uh, but first we need to kind of back up and make sure that we're all crystal clear on something. So you'll notice in the previous slide I said that generally speaking when we're talking about incorporated terms, we'll be talking about terms that have been somehow left out of the main body of contractual terms, but you still want to enforce them anyway. Um, yes, that is actually most of the times that you'll be using the phrase incorporated terms. But if you kind of think about it from the ground up, 
and you bring in that notion of ascent, you might ask yourself the logical question, well, how is it that the terms um, of a contract, a written contract, uh, are assented to? What is the thing that makes those written terms in the main body of the contract justiciable? And uh, normally when you're talking about a complete discussion of incorporated terms, you will start at the very beginning. Let's start at the very beginning. Uh, and the terms of the, of the contract in the main body are incorporated and made justiciable by signature. That's the traditional way that you will start off your discussion of incorporated terms. So if you've signed the document, uh, because signature is such a serious undertaking, you'll probably be bound for it, even if you haven't really read the terms properly. So uh, the main authority here is Lestrange and Grawcombe. That involved uh, the sale and purchase of a cigarette vending machine <laughs> in the bad old days. This was 1934. Uh, and what happened there, uh, the contract included a merger clause, which we've uh, already discussed previously in terms of uh, our second video on the parole evidence rule. Uh, and that clause read, uh, this agreement contains all the terms and conditions under which I agree to purchase the machine specified above and any express or implied condition statement or warranty, statutory or otherwise not stated herein is hereby excluded. So the typical kind of merger clause. So what happened? Things went pear-shaped. Uh, actually, the machine was defective. Mrs Lestrange tried to uh, sue Grawk Limited for the defect in the machine. She argued that there was a breach of a statutorily implied term of fitness for purpose. When you sell something, it's got to be fit to do the thing that you say it will do. Uh, we will be looking at implied terms in the next video in this series, uh, and we will be looking at statutorily implied terms of fitness for purpose uh, elsewhere in this unit in other video series but unfortunately for Mrs Lestrange because she had signed the contract for the vending machine uh, which included that uh, that nasty little exclusion clause uh, it was held that she had to stand by what she had signed she was bound by the exclusion clause and she couldn't uh, claim breach of the statutorily implied term. Now you'd have a lot of trouble arguing uh, that kind of case today because you, you actually nowadays can't exclude the statutory uh, implication of fitness for purpose but we'll talk about that in another video. So that's the main case of Lestrange and Gork. If you've signed a contract nine times out of ten you're going to be bound by the terms of that contract. They have been incorporated by your signature even if they do nasty things like that. However, the uh, rule uh, of incorporation by signature is uh, displaced in a number of ways. And the first and uh, most logical way to displace the rule is by arguing successfully that in fact uh, the signed document has no contractual effect. Now the conceptually more easy case to uh, kick off discussions here is the Hill and Wright case and uh, this was a little case that involved carriage of machinery uh, and it was a verbal contract between the parties um, and what happened was the machinery was carried, it was delivered and then after delivery uh, a couple of documents were handed to uh, the recipient um, who signed off on the documents um, and the document in, <laughs> in question contained one of those nasty little exclusion clauses uh, excluding liability for damage. Um, now this uh, carriage of machinery went on for several months, about seven months I think it was, uh, and there was somewhere like ten uh, separate times that these documents had been handed to the recipient um, after the machinery had been uh, delivered. They signed off and, and it kind of looked as though they were acknowledging that there had been this exclusion for liability uh, for damage. Ultimately, uh, on another occasion, uh, the machinery was carried, it was damaged in, damaged in transit, and the question was whether the uh, transport company could rely on the exclusion clause that was contained in the paperwork. Um, 
And in that case, uh, the documents had always been served after the machinery had been delivered. So notwithstanding that they had been signed off, they, you couldn't really say that they had contractual effect. There was nothing in the document that was uh, agreed to before performance of the contract. The contract was the verbal contract at the, at the very beginning. Um, each of the, the times that the documents were delivered after that, essentially just, you know, they looked like delivery dockets almost. Uh, you couldn't really say that they, uh, they had some kind of contractual purport. The harder case, so that's the case where you've got uh, the documents being served after performance of the contract and clearly there's going to be no contractual effect. Okay, the slightly conceptually more difficult case is where the document is signed at the same time as uh, performance of the obligations and that's what happened in the Warmings Used Cars and Tucker case. And this was uh, the sale and purchase of a vehicle between two used car dealers um, and what happened was there was a verbal agreement to sell and buy the vehicle on the one day. The next day when the purchaser uh, uh, finalised the transaction, uh, they asked the seller to sign their purchase book. And uh, that signature in the purchase book was required by statute. Now, uh, it represented that uh, in the purchase book, it represented that uh, the, the vehicle was... Um, the property of the seller and they had good title to pass on uh, and you guessed it, the seller didn't have good title to pass on. The question was whether uh, there had been a term incorporated into the contract that uh, the selling dealer uh, had good title to pass on to the purchaser and it was the court's opinion that there was no such uh, term incorporated into the contract. Uh, it was the, the court's view that the earlier verbal agreement constituted the bargain between the parties and uh, unless you could show some kind of evidence of, of a new contract that somehow varied the original verbal agreement uh, and was signed off on, uh, then the terms of the verbal agreement would prevail and uh, no evidence was forthcoming and uh, so the verbal agreement prevailed, uh, no warranty that uh, the seller had good title. So that is the issue of incorporating uh, terms into a contract by signature. So Lestrange and Grawcob, the very basic situation of um, you can't deny the terms that are contained within the contract itself that you've signed, fairly obvious. But then it kind of teases out into some more difficult, nice questions when you try and uh, get around that rule and you're trying to introduce terms into the contract by way of a document that is separate to the main body of the contract that you've signed off on. So what are some other ways that uh, this notion that terms might be incorporated by signature can be defeated or displaced? Apart from arguing that the Thing has no contractual uh, significance. Well, you can say that the document you signed was uh, the contents were misrepresented to you, and uh, misrepresentation will be covered uh, in more detail elsewhere when we do vitiating factors. But essentially, that's what happened in the Curtis case. Poor old Mrs. Curtis dropped off her wedding dress to the dry cleaners, uh, was handed a receipt. Uh, with some printing on it. She said, oh, what's all this? Uh, the lady said, oh, we just ask you to sign because we need to cover ourselves uh, in case uh, there's damage to beads or sequins. Mrs. Curtis thought, mm, okay, fair enough, signed the document. In fact, the document contained a much wider exclusion clause that covered the dry cleaners for any damage whatsoever. Uh, and eventually the wedding dress came back. It was horribly stained uh, and Mrs. Curtis sued. Um, the dry cleaners tried to rely on the exclusion clause that was printed on the document that Mrs. Curtis signed uh, and she was able to avoid that term because the contents of the document had been misdescribed to her. So there's another way to get around that notion. Uh, another way is by a little action that we call non s factum. Non s factum, it's just Latin for it is not my deed. Uh, and the case that established uh, sets out probably most clearly this rule is Galley and Lee. And what happened there was uh, Mrs. Galley had this house that was on a long hold lease interest. Uh, 
she liked her her nephew very much. Um, I think his name was Parkin. Um, she wanted to gift this leasehold to Parkin, uh, and Parkin came round. A, a a deed was signed. Mrs. Galley uh, didn't have her glasses with her, so she didn't read the document. Uh, what happened? The deed actually was prepared by uh, Lee and Parkin, and uh, it ended up that it, is, it assigned the leasehold interest to Lee instead of to her nephew. Uh, what did Lee do with the, the title to this leasehold interest? He went off and mortgaged it, raised some, some cash and spent up big time. When he defaulted uh, uh, with the bank, well, the bank called in the mortgage uh, and tried to enforce it against Mrs. Galley. Uh, Mrs. Galley tried to argue non est factum, and uh, there are a few requirements for establishing non est factum. That is, the document you've signed uh, was not actually your deed for some reason, uh, and you have to be a claimant that belongs to a particular and very narrow class of people. You have to be either unable to read or unable to understand the whole purport of the contract. So you're not even aware of the motions that your hand was per performing when you signed the document. Um, okay, so she didn't read the document here and she had uh, Parkin and Lee describe it to her. Uh, even if she fell into the relevant class, the problem is then the next requirement is that the claimant has to believe the document was radically different, radically different what it actually was and here is where she really fell down because Mrs Galley knew that she was essentially giving away her leasehold interest in this property. Um, the court said well whether you gave it to Parkin or whether you gave it to Lee the thing is what you signed was a deed that was assigning your interest away. Um, it's the same thing it's not radically different uh, so far as the law is concerned, whether it goes to one party or another is, you know, almost a trifling matter. So far as the law is concerned, the essence of the document was an assignment. Uh, and uh, the last requirement for non-est factum is that, at least against innocent parties, uh, the claimant's failure to read and understand the document is not due to carelessness uh, on their part. Note that this business about the failure to read and understand the document wasn't due to carelessness. That's actually a subjective test. Wow, folks, uh, this doesn't happen very often in contract law. Blue moon. So file that one away in your memory banks. Uh, what I might do, folks, is because this video is getting a little lengthy, uh, is we'll chop it in half and uh, we will come back for part two of uh, incorporated terms. And uh, then after that video, we will move on to uh, implied terms. So uh, come back for video six and then it looks like video seven. Thanks, guys. I'll see you soon.